Mexico, one plate at a time, is made possible by these funders. Bohemia, 100 years of Mexican craftsmanship. Bohemia, Mexican imported beer. Your chipotle shrimp, fruit tart, stir fry, marinara, enchilada, lobster minestrone, weekend roast, french toast maker has arrived. Five Star, unleash your genius. The waters of Mexico's Baja Peninsula are incredibly fertile with seafood that's not only prized by those that live nearby, but by connoisseurs all over the world. And you could imagine that such enthusiasm for Baja seafood could lead to overfishing which is why some have turned to aquaculture, a practice that in many cases is considerably more sustainable. Along with a couple of local chefs, Benito Molina and Alain Henchi, I headed out into that sweet spot where the Bay of Ensenada meets the Pacific Ocean. I knew that these guys would have a really deep understanding of local aquaculture. I mean, they cook with these products every day. Juan Carlos La Puente was generous enough to take us out to see his oyster and mussel production, where we found some divers bringing up crates of oysters to haul onto the boats. So explain to me what the diver is doing. Okay, the, the diver went down. Yes. And, and he unrolled the, the he, baskets. He unties the baskets He made there. a signal to the, uh -huh. the, the person in the boat. Yes. And with the crane, we get it out. And then they'll bring him up. What are they pulling up there? Is that oysters? Uh, oysters. That's oysters. We pull like uh, 50 doses per basket. 50 dozen per, per basket. basket. Well, yeah. a lot of oysters. How long does yeah. it take to throw them out? To One, their year. Full size? One year. One year. One year. Hale, Okay, now I gotta, I gotta have one. So you can open, open it up. You got a screwdriver here, right? Yeah. So you're doing it with a knife, and he's doing it with a screwdriver, which is what I would probably do in a place like this. Okay. It's that pure, clean sea flavor. That is brilliant. We broke into that crate of oysters. Man, I'd never tasted an oyster that fresh. As we headed off to another part of Juan Carlos's aquaculture operation, where he grows mussels, but instead of being cultivated in crates, mussels attach themselves to a rope that's protected by this huge long net that they call a sock. And that's where they grow to maturity. So explain to me, now, the, the, he's pulled up those mussels and they're on some sort of a line there, right? Yeah, they, there's a diver on, under the water. A diver that's down there and he's yeah. doing, he's unhooking them or something? Unhooking them. And we have uh, 300 uh, socks over the, this Three, line. I see, 300 and, of them over here. Yeah, and it, it produced like six tons per line. Six tons per line in a year. That's a lot of, that's a lot of muscles. Yeah. That's a lot of muscles. I think my companion sensed how eager I was to get into the kitchen with our fresh harvested crustaceans. So we headed back to the mainland and we unloaded our bounty. There's this restaurant right on the docks called Muelle Tres, and the chefs there regularly have Juan Carlos's oysters and mussels on the menu. So they weren't that surprised, I think, to see us hauling our catch right through the front door. They began by cleaning the oysters and popping open their shells, then arranging them on a tray for us to enjoy with some vinegary sauce to spoon on. The mussels were treated with an equally simple, delicious preparation. They were de-bearded and rinsed. Then the chef put them in a pot and added diced tomatoes, onions, cilantro-infused olive oil, and a good douse of beer. It only takes mussels a couple of minutes at a steady, strong simmer for them to open up and release their delicious liquid into the steaming broth. Salud. Salud. Primero. Antes que todo. Salud. Can I pass you an oyster? I think they're fresh. I think they're fresh. Okay, so we have salt. We have limon. Chile. 
That's delicious. Gracias. They're so full. I mean, they, they taste fatty almost, you know? They're just such good muscles. And there is also a beautiful story, you know? The, the darker color ones uh -huh. are the females and the lighter color ones are the males. Is that a story or is that the truth? No, it's the truth. That's the truth. So what's your favorite way to cook mussels? My favorite I with uh, coconut milk and chili. Mm. Well, that sounds fabulous. Yeah, great idea. Well, I love mussels anyway, so now I can go home with all kinds. I gotta get home and start cooking. <laughs> My chef friend in Ensenada, Benito Molina, he makes this mussel dish with his local mussels that he calls mussels with six chilies. So that got me thinking a little bit, and here's my version of it. The first thing that you have to do is make this kind of homemade chili powder. And six chilies, well, chilies each offer something different to the mix. So I've got a whole variety of dried chilies out here, and I'm gonna combine ancho chili, that's the one that's sort of that light cranberry colored one. Uh, this is the long black pasilla chili. It's a more robust flavor, deep, dark, rich. The guajillo chili, well that's one that's bold and bright tangy flavored. We've got some chipotle chili here. I'll put about three of those guys in here. And then arbol chili, the workhorse of the Mexican kitchen. So all the chilies that are large need to be cleaned of their seeds and their stems. Open those out like that. Let the seeds fall out. Now with the small chilies, you just take the stems off if they have stems. I'm gonna combine all of them onto a baking dish. And we're going to put them into a 325 degree oven and toast them until they're almost crisp feeling. That should take about 10 minutes. You want to break them into smallish pieces so that you can make your own chili powder. But this is going to be very different than chili powder you would buy at the grocery store. It's not going to have the salt, sugar, and all the spices, including that huge dash of cumin that you find in all chili powder. Okay, so I've got my spice grinder here. You can do this in one of the high-speed blenders as well. And I'm gonna fill that about two thirds, three quarters full with a batch of the mixed chilies and then start pulverizing. So I'll put those into a little sealable container there and do the other half. so amazing. It's more complex and more vibrant than any chili powder you'll ever find anywhere. Okay, now on to the muscle part of this dish. The first thing that you have to do is to clean the muscles. They usually will come in a bag, a mesh bag, not in a closed plastic bag. That'll actually kill the muscles. And now on to the cleaning. You want to look to see if there's any beards on them. That's where they attached to whatever rope-like substance that they were growing on. And then use a vegetable brush. Give them a good scrub until all of them have been scrubbed. Now for the flavorings for the mussel dish, I'm gonna start with a little bit of chorizo, one of my favorite combinations when it comes to seafood is shellfish and chorizo. And I need about four ounces of it here. And then I'm gonna put that into a pot, break that up and cook that until it's completely done through. That'll take about eight or 10 minutes.
the chorizo is starting to brown now, I'm going to add a couple of cloves of garlic. So, peeling by mashing and then finely chopping. And that's going to go in with the chorizo. About two thirds of a cup of dry white wine. Some of the chili powder. Now, this will take some experience on your part as to how much exactly you want to put in. Stir all that together. Then the mussels. That really aromatic and flavorful cooking liquid there. Now put the lid on and it'll only take about three minutes or so for those mussels to open up. So check them after a couple to see how they're coming along. I'm cutting thick slices of sourdough bread, drizzling it with some olive oil, sprinkling on some salt, and then grilling it to serve alongside those mussels to sop up all the delicious juices. I think these guys are done. But we have a couple of little things to add to that. Ah, look at that. Sprinkle a little bit of salt over the whole dish. I'm going to enrich it with a couple of tablespoons of butter. And then I'm going to add, as final garnish, you could use just a little bit more chili, as far as I can tell. I'm going to sprinkle that over the top of it. And then stir everything around with a large spoon until that butter melts. And everything's coated with the chorizo broth. A lovely sprinkling of chopped fresh cilantro over the whole thing, and you've got a muscle feast. Chef Benito Molina offered to step us through some of the signature seafood preparations at his restaurant, Manzanilla. I love this guy. I mean, he's an imaginative, knowledgeable, and accomplished cook whose food speaks delicious volumes about seafood in and around Ensenada. At his restaurant, Benito was offering three different varieties of oysters. He picked two of them and prepared each one differently. The first type of oyster he put into his beautiful wood-burning oven to smoke over the smoldering coals. The sauce that he made for those oysters was a rich tarragon and butter sauce. I know that sounds incredibly French, but he infused it with this very Mexican blend of six different powdered dried chilies. For the kumiai oysters that we had harvested earlier in the morning, he cut up bits of pickled pig's feet to add to a dressing that he had prepared with cucumbers and sherry vinegar and the raw oysters were served with a nice spoonful of that pig's feet dressing. Next, Benito showed us a fantastic preparation for the local aquacultured abalone he's so passionate about. After separating the abalone from the shell and cleaning it, he started a sauce with garlic and olive oil. Local olive oil. To that, he added some epazote and some chopped smoked tomatoes. He browned the abalone in a heavy skillet over high heat. That was a little surprising to me. I thought abalone would require low heat. Then he added a little Mexican crema to finish the sauce. After a squirt of white wine, he left the abalone to steam in the pan while he and his sous chef worked on the presentation. I sat down with Benito's wife, Solange, who is a fount of knowledge when it comes to local wines. I had asked her to pair a wine with each one of Benito's dishes. Now tell me about this wine. Where is it from? What are the grapes? Who made it? This is a wine that it's made in France by a Mexican winemaker. You know Hugo? I know Hugo. Um, Hugo da Costa. But I wanted to surprise you. You really <laughs> did surprise me in that. But you know, the food here in Baja is such a mix of different influences from different places. Uh, these oysters, smoked oysters, and then it's got butter on it with 
French tarragon, which certainly will go there, and all of these different chilies powdered in there. So it's a mix. It's a mix. <laughs> okay, it's a, I've got to try, try one of these because, yeah, you, would love when, it. you know me, I, I'm always salivating as I think about these beautiful flavors. I'm loving that. I know. <laughs> you have surprised <laughs> me beyond belief here. I'm ready for the next dish. Me too. Okay. <laughs> The first wine had a lot of golden color to it. This is a much lighter colored mm -hmm. wine. What is this one? This is wine is from Porvenir, de la Escuelita. I think it's Sauvignon Blanc. It tastes Plain. like Sauvignon, yeah. It, it has that flavor that I associate with Baja wines that is... Saltiness, yeah, it has a saltiness. saltiness. And that is something that I think is characteristic, especially of the white wines that you find from the Valle de Guadalupe. Now, when I think about that mineral and salty, I think about oysters. Yes. So yes. I can't imagine what the flavor is going to be like exactly. You're you're in that place where you've got the similar textures that sort of little bit fatty pig's foot mm -hmm. is like the fattiness of the oyster. And that chewiness. No? It's that, that's, I'm sorry to say, I, the only word I can come up with is brilliant. I know, okay? I know. That is it's a good brilliant. recipe. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good recipe. That's, that's my kind of wine. It's actually the Sinfandel from Silvestre, and the other one is Petit Verdot. Easy to drink. It's easy to drink, but it's rich and, and with the smoked and tomato. Well, that's you will see. You, you will know, see. that's exactly what I was thinking: is that it would go so beautifully mm -hmm. with the smoked tomato part of this. Now. Abalone is not something that everybody knows about. No. And they haven't tasted it, they, have, they don't know the rich flavor of it and everything. I find its texture to be one of the most fabulous parts of, of eating abalone. It has a kind of lovely chewiness, chewiness but not, well, it's almost crispness. Now, with the wine, We have a happy match too. I know. I, you, you know the wines. You know the wines of the area. You know Benito's food. It, this dish, that wine, says so much about Ensenada. It says so much about love of craft yes. and whether the craft is cooking, knowing just how to prepare that abalone or how to make that beautiful wine. The whole thing goes together so remarkably well. I thank know. you very much. No, I'm gonna thanks have another, for coming. I'm going to have another bite. Eat it all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest, abalone is pretty unfamiliar to a lot of us. And so is erizo, sea urchin. But erizo is so abundant here that it's actually the namesake of a restaurant in Tijuana that's owned by another of my chef friends, Javier Plasencia. And if you've never had it before, there's no better place to try Eriso than at Eriso. You know what I love about cevicherias, uh, ceviche places, is that you can go there by yourself if you want to, just get a full-flavored, refreshing snack. You can go with a big group of people and order a whole lot of different things, ceviches. Well, like this menu, there's tostadas to start with on the menu, and they have all different kinds of seafood that they just put on tostadas, a quick little munch. You can get the classic ceviches, but well, this is a little bit more upscale here, and you find ceviches that are modern, like with cilantro puree in them, you see ones from Peru, you see different things with clams in them. Well, it's ceviche for a new era, let's just say that. What I ordered was a ceviche that's made from raw shrimp, lime juice, pureed cilantro in there, and then bits of cucumber and avocado. That's one of my favorite dishes in this particular cevicheria. I've also ordered something that, well, may seem a little bit out there to some of you. It is leche de tigre, which is the juice poured off of the fish after marinating it in lime, with a little sea urchin and a raw quail.
Here's the shrimp ceviche tostada with a puree of cilantro in it. A little bit of cucumber, the red onions. It's totally refreshing and delicious. And if you like cilantro, this is the kind of dish you really want to have. Sea urchin. The juice that's drained off of ceviche. So lime, fish flavor, some salt. Read on the menu that this is flavored with a little habanero chili, spicy quail egg on the side. We just dump the quail egg in there. Sea urchin goes into the same glass there. And then down the hatch. Ceviche is all about freshness. And the good thing about making shrimp ceviche is that, well, most of the shrimp that we can buy is very fresh right before it's frozen. And then you can buy it frozen and defrost it in your refrigerator overnight. Now, I'm gonna make a green ceviche for you. A little unusual because it's just filled with herbs and green chili, and of course it's filled with lime juice because that's one of the defining elements in a ceviche. So I'm gonna fresh squeeze a half a cup of lime juice to get it started. And to that, I'm going to add a couple of tomatillos, just raw tomatillos. When you use them this way, they have a really light and tangy characteristic to them that's beautiful with the shrimp. And now the herb, which is cilantro for this preparation. I'm simply going to tear off a good handful, put it into the blender jar, along with little salt and then blend it until it sort of looks slushy. The next step is to cut up our defrosted shrimp. This has already been peeled and deveined and I'm going to cut it into about half inch pieces. Now the shrimp go into a bowl and I'm going to stir in our green mixture and we're going to allow this to marinate, to pickle, to ceviche for about a half an hour in the refrigerator. Now for spiciness in this dish, we're gonna combine a very spicy habanero, or a little bit of it, and a serrano chili. I'm gonna chop those finely. Now a little chives. And lastly, an avocado. Take the little button end out of it, cut around the avocado, twist the two sides apart like that. Remove the pit, scoop the ripe avocado flesh out of the skin, and then cut it into small dice. The ceviche has been marinating for half an hour now. I'm gonna scoop in the spicy and herbal elements, and now the avocado. And then stir that all around. You don't even have to be at the sea to enjoy great seafood. Okay, so I fired up your appetite. Some of my favorite dishes, entertaining tips, and Mexican travel inspirations. Well, now I want to hear what you have to say. Visit us at rickbayless.com TV for recipes and a whole lot more.
This program was made possible by Bohemia, 100 years of Mexican craftsmanship. Bohemia, Mexican imported beer. Your chipotle shrimp, fruit tart, stir fry, marinara, enchilada, lobster, minestrone, weekend roast, French toast maker has arrived. Five Star, unleash your genius.